السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا على الصلاة حيا على الصلاة حيا على الفلاح حيا على الفلاح الله أكبر الله إن الحمد لله نحمره ونسعله ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله in my bad, we have a principle within Islam. We have a principle within our Sharia, within Islamic law. This principle is actually one of five. One of the five of the greatest principles that we have within the faith of Islam. All of scholarship agrees upon this principle as well as the other four. Regardless of tradition and law, regardless of madhab, regardless of historical placement, whether we're speaking to scholarship in classical times, in the medieval time period, or in our contemporary times now. That principle, it is al-ada muhkama. Some express it as al-ada muhkama. Others express it as al-ada mu'tabara. This principle is that culture is a judge. Culture is a distinguishing factor within Islam. Our Lord 
Tabaraka wa ta'ala, the best of the exalted, he is mentioned. خُذُ الْعَفْوَى وَأْمَرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِدْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Undergo pardon. Enjoin the uruf and turn away from the ignorant. Let's walk through. Although it states, Khud al Afu, practice Afu, practice pardoning. And so we can understand the meaning of pardon. We offer you this. We're used to hearing forgiveness, and we might think that pardon and forgiveness are synonymous, but they're not. You see, if Allah forgives you, yes, it is true that he will veil that misgiving of yours. Yes, it is true that you may not be taken into account for that by way of being punished, but it's still on your slate and you may still have to stand in front of Allah and fess up to it. It doesn't go away. Forgave you, but I didn't forget. When Allah pardons you, it's as if you've never done it at all. It's wiped away from your record. It's as if it never happened. So throughout the Quran, when we come across these encouragements from our Lord telling us to pardon, understand that's a higher level than merely forgiving. Our Lord is encouraging us to take the higher road. Can you delve into your spirituality enough that when you were wronged by someone because of your iman, because of your faith, you can interact with that person as though it never happened at all. That's afu. That's part. And this is what our Lord is ordering us to do here. Khudul afu. Practice pardoning. He then says, what more bil urf? And command with the urf. Enjoin with the urf. And we're going to say enjoin with good. But really, al-uruf here means al-ma'ruf. Command that which is well known. Command or enjoin that which the people are familiar with. This is the evidence within the Quran of culture. Our Lord is ordering us to command with and to enjoin our culture amongst one another. And across cultures, and turn away from the ignoramus. Turn away from the people who are ignorant. Don't get involved in foolish affairs. Sometimes it's better to not engage. Sometimes it's better to be silent. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated, Min samata naja. Whoever is silent will be successful. If you're coming from a standpoint of logic, if you're coming from a standpoint of, of evidence, if you're coming from a standpoint of academics, if you're coming from a standpoint of experience, and the person that you're engaging has none of the above, nor does that person respect any of the above, you're not going to get anywhere with that individual. Our discussion today, is weighing culture against worship. In order to begin this process of weighing between the two, we must explore a prophetic tradition that is known to all of us here. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned in the Al-A'malu bin Niyat, where in the Malikulimri'in Manawa. Actions are premised upon their intentions. And everyone will have what he or she has intended. Meaning, the validity of your actions and your actions being accepted by Allah are premised upon what you intend. 
is premised upon the internal. The external is meant to be an expression of the internal. So then the niya or the intention, it is al-azam ala fi'il. It is the decision to perform an action. That's what the intention actually is. It's happening here, before it comes here, before it comes here. It's here first. This is the intention. Actions are premised upon it. And you'll be rewarded in accordance with what your intention is. So then it makes sense to us why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would tell us the person that intends to perform a good deed but doesn't perform that good deed will still receive a good deed on the record because the intention itself is an action. What goes on inside of your heart is a deed that is recorded. Further, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also tells us, and this will make this make sense, that a person intends a good deed, the person performs a good deed, and then the person is rewarded 10 times its like, up to 700 times its like, through ad infinitum. What is the difference between the individual that's rewarded as though this person has performed this action 10 times and the one that's performed it 700 times and the one that has performed it out into infinity? Same action. The difference is the intention. The difference is the level of purity. The difference is what are you doing and why are you doing it? The better you get at that, the better you get at purifying that, the better you get at growing that, the greater the deed becomes. So then guess what? Eventually, due to the size of your intention, you may need less action to earn the mercy of Allah. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. The best and the exalted. But we continue. The intention is so profound that it distinguishes between things. We have an individual who is praying two units of prayer here, another individual praying two units of prayer there, another individual praying two units of prayer over there. All of them are praying it the same exact way. No difference from start to finish, from standing to taslim, from takbir to taslim, same. Yet this person is praying to hear to the masjid. This person is greeting the masjid. This person is praying to voluntary prayers before an obligatory prayer. This person is praying the Fajr prayer. Then we understand that the intention not only impacts the validity of your act of worship, not only does it impact whether your act of worship is accepted or not, it actually impacts what the act of worship is itself. So then your intention distinguishes between acts of worship. Let's give another example. We have one individual who bathes the self. Another individual does the same. Yet, one individual is bathing the self in order to enter into a state of purification for Jumu'ah, for this prayer that we're engaging in right now. Another person bathes the self because the person wants to cool off. The person wants to warm up. The person wants to smell good. The person just wants to be clean. Same act, but the intention makes the difference. The intention, it makes the difference for us between what can be an act of worship and what is culture. So then when we are weighing one's culture against Islam, we must do so with the proper scales. We must do so with the intention in mind. We must do so understanding that for one individual, he may be eating and he's just eating because the person is hungry or the person enjoys food or it is a cultural, traditional dish, and the person is just eating it. Yet another individual eating the same dish because the individual intends by eating it, not just enjoyment, not just to engage with my culture, not just because I'm hungry, but this individual intends that by way of this food that I'm eating, I want to gain strength and power from it 
in order to worship Allah with the strength I receive from it. Now, for this person, it started as culture, it started as a customary norm, but now for this person, it becomes worship, all by way of the niyyah, all by way of the intention. So I say these words of mine, وَاسْتَغْفِرُ li وَلَكُمْ And as he forgets myself as well as for you all, فَاسْتَغْفِرُوهُ So seek his forgiveness. إِنَّهُ هُوَ غَفُرُ رَحِيمٌ Certainly he is of forgiving, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiya ba'da imma ba'd Allah the mighty and the majestic he is mentioned wa ma yantiku an al-hawa in wa illa wahyun yuha and he doesn't speak of his own hawa he doesn't speak of his own desire but rather it is revelation that has been revealed to him the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not speaking from the standpoint of false theology. That's what Hawa actually is. He's not speaking from the standpoint of a male. He's not speaking from the standpoint of being inclined toward other than revelation. He's not speaking from the standpoint of being inclined toward falsehood. No. But when he speaks, he is speaking from the standpoint of revelation. And as such, we understand that whether the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is speaking from the standpoint of the Quran or speaking from the standpoint of the Sunnah, if it is revelation from Allah, then both we consider to be revelation from Allah. Very simple and straightforward. Allah the Mighty, the Majestic, is mentioned. Whatever the messenger is giving you, then take it. And whatever he forbids you from, then abstain from it. Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah the mighty and the majestic is mentioned. Whoever obeys the messenger, then he has obeyed Allah. We've heard these things before. But we do have to question. When we say the word sunnah, what do we actually mean by what we're saying? Because we're saying the same word, but a lot of us mean something different when we're saying this word. And we assume we're saying the same thing, but we're often saying something different. So we'll explain what we mean by what we say today when we use this word sunnah. If we are speaking from the standpoint of the field of prophetic tradition, from the, of the field of hadith, then the meaning of sunnah is whatever has been reported on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of statement, action, tacit approval, his physical characteristics, his character, and his biographical account. All that means sunnah. And if we understand that all of this means sunnah, then this can range from being obligatory to being encouraged, to being neutral, to being discouraged, to being outright unlawful. Depends on what the prophetic tradition is. Good. That's our premise for our point. Here's our point. There are different categorizations of sunnah. We present today a less often quoted categorization of sunnah. We can categorize sunnah and say that there is something called sunnah to ibadah and then there is something called sunnah to adah. There is a sunnah that is an act of worship and there is a sunnah that is cultural. Let's state what we're, what we're actually talking about here. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's mentioned. Pray the way that you all see me praying. 
That's sunnah to the ibadah. This is a sunnah that is an act of worship. Okay. So then because of this, and because it is an act of worship, we understand within our law, within our faith, that anything that is an act of worship is haram for you to do. It is unlawful to worship Allah. Imagine that. It is unlawful to worship Allah unless you have revelation or evidence sourced and backed by revelation in order to worship Allah that way. If you do not have revelation from Allah or you do not have evidence that is backed by revelation from Allah, you can't worship Allah. Meaning you can only pray the way that the Prophet ﷺ prayed from takbir to taslim. You cannot enter your culture into it. You cannot enter your personal opinion into it. You have to do it as it was revealed. Okay. That's one type of sunnah. But then we have something else called sunnah al ada the sunnah of custom, the sunnah of culture. And this is where some of us get confused sometimes. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he enjoyed honey. He liked things that were sweet. Yes, no? We all know this. Yes, no? So now the question becomes, if you choose to like honey, do you get a good deed for that? If you don't eat honey, worse, if you don't like honey, are you now opposing the sunnah because you don't like honey? Let's mention another example. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would customarily wear on his feet something called ni'al, something that we call sandals today. His sandals that he would wear would have two straps on the sandals that he would wear. This is how he would typically dress. So now you, if you don't wear sandals, are you opposing the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? If you wear a sandal with one strap instead, instead of two straps, are you no longer a Sunni Muslim? Hopefully we see where we're going. There are certain areas that we have to make distinctions. So then we understand that the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was from a people and initially gave the message to a people who happened to be of the Arab people. Just so happens. So then his culture just so happens to be a culture that is also an out of culture. The understanding here isn't necessarily that in order to be in accordance with the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all Muslims in all places and all times have to mimic our culture. That's not the lesson here. The lesson is that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not change the culture of his people. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam accepted the culture of his people. The only time that he made adjustments was when the law and revelation required him to make adjustments to bring the culture back in conformity with revelation. Only time he made adjustments. So then you and I regardless of what our culture is. There's nothing wrong with your culture just because it is your culture. Nothing wrong with that. Islam did not come to change who you are. Islam came to enhance who you are. Hopefully we understand this. So then, as such, we engage with the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We understand further that whether you choose to wear a turban or not, whether you choose to wear an izar or not, whether you choose to wear a thobe or not, the broader question becomes, however you are dressing culturally, is it in alignment with revelation? Is it in alignment with the sharia? Is it in alignment with Islamic law? 
is it in alignment with the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam when it comes to sunnatul ibadah when it comes to the sunnah of worship and servitude and in these cultural areas for example yes the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wore something on his feet true but at the same time when he was praying and there was some filth that was on his shoes while he was praying and the angel Jibreel السلام, came to him and informed him of that he then removed the shoes to maintain the purity of his prayer so it's not necessarily the cultural dress but our law and what we do with our culture can now become worship we'll give you something a little bit deeper our final point for today whether you wear a turban or not or your turban is this color or that color perhaps it's just culture and you can do that because it's culture no problem however if you are wearing a rida and an izar, if you are wearing a thobe, if you are wearing a turban, if you are wearing your hair in a fashion that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam will wear his hair, and your intention for doing so is not coming from the place of culture, not because you just happen to be an Arab but you're doing so purely out of love for the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and wanting to be like him and emulate him in every aspect of your life that you are able to then at this point for you your emulation of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in areas that for him were culture for you can become ibadah for you can become worship but as we live our lives and as we are in this melting pot of the Americas and we have to have respect for each other's cultures and as the indigenous and population of the Americas embraces Islam more, the indigenous population doesn't have to forego their culture for other cultures that they will be importing. It doesn't have to be that way. Those who are here from elsewhere, you can keep your culture. Those that are here from here, you can keep your culture. And what is supposed to happen is, this is supposed to be a segue for us to come together and complement one another in the areas that our different cultures have strengths and so that we can heal one another in the areas that our different cultures have weaknesses. This is Islam. This is Revelation. This is our sharia. This is our law. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab al-nar. Hada wa lahu a'lamu sallallahu ala muhammad wa qima salah. لا فقامت الصلاة فقامت صلى الله وفر الله وفر لا إله إلا الله استو وأتجد وترازم